Hello. Good morning. Thank you for, for being here to, to wrangle with some, some tough problems. Um, that's what we'll be getting into more of this morning. Um, also, thank you, Jeffrey and, and Eric and the whole AEA team um, and the broader AEA, uh, uh, an event apart and a list apart families. Ten years ago, about half my career ago, um, a List Apart was the first organization to really publish my writing about content strategy. And when I think about that time, uh, our community was smaller then. And, and we trusted familiar voices, voices that became more familiar um, through our individual blogs and, and writing in outlets like ALA. And we dished on the details and nuance of our work. And sometimes we also got vulnerable with each other about how to make a better web. But the web was smaller then, and um, our problems were also smaller then. And now I think our problems are a lot bigger, a lot more complex, a lot more nuanced. And you know that all too well here. Um, the personal and political are very tough to decouple in our industry, I think, especially if you're doing it well on either side of that equation. And the problems that are bigger now, well, our responsibilities are also bigger, but I think our opportunities are too. And that's where I want to focus today. Uh, but before we talk about today, I want, to, I want to take us back. Back before the early days of the web, I want to take us back instead to, to 1961. So please, join me there, if you will. So in 1961, The Twilight Zone aired an episode called The Mirror. It takes us to a Central American dictatorship where a stealthy group of revolutionaries are working to overthrow the government. And they're led by someone named Ramos Clemente. And eventually, in a pivotal scene, he comes face to face with the dictator that they're trying to overthrow. And he confronts him, and, and the man realizes that um, he's about to be deposed. But first, he wants to bring Clemente in on a, on a little secret that he has. In his possession is this elaborate magic mirror. And he's always trusted this magic mirror. He's always looked at it because it could reveal the actions of his enemies long before they could happen. He trusted it to reveal his enemies and expose them before they became a threat. And of course, that didn't work out so well this time around. But still, he says, you too can trust this magic mirror. And Clemente scoffs at this whole notion of a magic mirror. He doesn't need it. He thinks it's silly. And the revolution is successful. And soon he assumes power. He inherits the mirror, kind of shoves it off to the side, like extra stuff that your parents bring you and then leave in your basement or something like that. He's like, I don't need this. Whatever, I'll open the box in the future. And things are going well until one day they're not. Turns out, new boss is the same as the old boss, and as Clemente rises in power, rises in stature, he becomes comfortable using the same repressive techniques as his predecessor. So he no longer sees himself as this scrappy revolutionary who, who led the charge and all and was working on behalf of the people. Now he sees himself as the revolution itself. He is infallible, like this anointed god, anointed leader. And eventually, that kind of starts creeping into his psyche. It changes how he sees himself. It also changes what he sees when he looks into the magic mirror. One day, he's walking past it, and in it, he starts seeing images of the friends with whom he seized power, except now they're plotting against him. They're going to overthrow him, and this throws him into a great fury. And he has his generals round them up one by one, and he questions them one by one. They deny it all one by one. They're not plotting against him. And he has them killed one by one. He doesn't believe what he's hearing. He doesn't believe what he's seeing from them. But he sure believes that magic mirror. So eventually, he's now alone. He walks past the mirror one day, and he sees himself. And this makes him furious. He becomes disgusted with this mirror that led him astray. And he picks up his gun, and he hurls it at the glass, breaks it into a thousand pieces. And outside at the time, a priest happens to be walking past his door. He hears all this commotion inside. He doesn't hear the sound of breaking glass. He hears the sound of a gunshot. So he hurries in, breaks down the door, rushes in to find Clemente there, dead on the floor in a pool of his own blood. The gun is still warm in his hand. And the mirror is perfect 
and shiny as it's ever been. So Clemente looked in that mirror, and he saw the world as he believed it. He saw himself and the world as he stood there viewing it. And 50 years later, we still do that. We frame the facts to fit not just what we want to see, but what we already believe in part about how we see ourselves. Now, neuroscience teaches us that we learn new information by fitting it to what we already know. That's how we learn. We take in new facts, new information, fit it into our existing mental models and very literally the existing neural networks that are there. But we also fit information into who we already are and what we already believe about ourselves. And that's challenging. That's something that we have to wrestle with because if we want to be successful as designers, we need to take that into account too. And here's why. Because today, when our users consider themselves and maybe look then to see how the world reflects them, they see kind of a confusing, distorted reflection, sort of a funhouse mirror that's not so fun. They see messaging inconsistency and bald-faced lies from the brands that they thought they knew, that they thought they could trust, whether they're in the media or on TV or politicians or maybe just the companies that they've purchased products from for, for decades. And they see few repercussions for those lies. And again, that's in companies and media outlets and politicians. The problem is they look at the world around them, they look at themselves, and the images don't coincide. So do you ever talk with clients about consistency and the professionalism around consistency, maybe in maintaining a design system or um, in not going rogue and breaking from the editorial style guidelines and flinging around serial commas even though everybody argued against them? That's a lot of my world and it's very important, Mark, let me tell you. Um, well, that's kind of core to this problem because when we talk about consistency and inconsistency and the dangers of it, Authenticity to expectation, in other words, delivering people what they expect, authenticity to expectation is the most basic kind of consistency. So that's what we talk about when we talk about how consistency builds trust and how inconsistency undermines it. That authenticity to expectation is the most basic type of consistency. Let's put a pin in that and come back to it because I'm not yet done with Clemente. So all of us here who make the web, engineers and designers, um, broadly, well, we're users too. We're consumers and citizens and readers and shoppers, maybe, maybe dropping our iPads on our faces or, um, or just using the web to go through life and build a reading experience and getting the stuff that we need delivered to us. And we used to place trust in familiar brands and established media. Maybe it was your hometown newspaper or the newspaper of record that you grew up with, getting it on Sundays. And those big brands, those big media outlets, they reflected our reality. But we don't trust those same institutions anymore. And maybe it's because they've been inconsistent with what they promise and how they deliver on it with what they claim and how they speak to us, the tone of voice that they use when they speak to us. And those creeping inconsistencies, they build up. They're kind of a sneaky thing. Because like us, our users look at the world now with more skepticism than trust. And healthy skepticism can be a good thing, to not just take things on faith. But in with skepticism, we kind of Trojan horse in some cynicism as well. And that's what's growing. And that's because the media and branches of government have told them, quite literally, and taught them not to trust the evidence of their own eyes. And that's gaslighting. And gaslighting has victims. And it's not just individual consumers or individual citizens. It's not just maybe family members that marinate in a single cable news station or get their content all from a single media outlet. Those are problems, too. Um, that's not what I'm trying to address here. Uh, but the victims of gaslighting do include mass media outlets that perpetuate it. And that's because the blowback from gaslighting is pretty broad. It affects every institution and every industry now in which we all work. So today, this kind of insidious cynicism, it undermines all the institutions in journalism and government services and public health and every sector of our community. 
So that means if you're in design or marketing or communications or any of like the technical industries that support them, creeping cynicism is a problem that undermines your work. But I think you're also well positioned to address it. Because here's the secret, here's sort of the, the problem statement, if you will, for the future of our work. What I've learned is that in order to regain the trust of our audiences, we must empower them. So that means if you work in retail services, if you work in government, if your uh, users are consumers or voters or donors or potential donors or students, to regain their trust, we must empower them. So what we're going to talk about is how to do that. But first, I want to talk a little bit briefly about why and why now. So let's look a little bit at some of our recent history around the erosion of trust. Um, and yeah, there are some roots for this in kind of the bickering bedfellows of media and politics. If we look back in previous elections, when we caught a politician flip-flopping, we castigated them for it. That was the kind of uh, issue that could possibly totally cut, uh, cut a campaign down to its knees, cause somebody to pull out. And why? It's because we like consistency. We like consistency in what we hear and what we see. In the 2016 election cycle, politicians of all stripes played fast and loose with facts, though. Um, here we have Rudy Giuliani conveniently forgetting September 11th. And this, I will just remind you, this is the same Giuliani that Joe Biden once famously said could form every single sentence with a noun, a verb, and 9-11. Not so in this case. Most major media outlets, though, they let this kind of problem slide. And that makes sense because most media outlets in their kind of daily reporting, they report on what politicians say. They report on what brands say. There's not so much time in those fast news cycles to report on inconsistencies in what they've said over time. That takes kind of a deeper attention to the details and more time to evolve that kind of story. Now, we like it when we can see that politicians are demonstrating personal evolution, where maybe they held one view, but they took in new information through new lived experiences, or maybe getting more input from their constituents, and they've been able to wrangle with those ideas and change their thinking to evolve over time. We like seeing that kind of personal evolution because it demonstrates humility and a willing to learn and a willing to maybe evaluate one's own beliefs and change. But we don't like when we see flip-flopping. That seems a lot more cheap. We don't usually like that. Except, of course, when we can mock it. And that's always fabulous. Here you can see um, a pair of uh, limited edition $30 flip-flops, celebrate flip-flops um, from designer Sam Morrison. And look, you have options. We are truly in a glorious time for shower shoes, thanks to our politicians, in part. So we can joke about it, and maybe it does not matter that much in the short term. Flip-flopping didn't change so much our perceptions of the individual politicians that we supported. In survey after survey and poll after poll during the last election cycle, Citizens heard politicians flip-flop. We recognized it when it happened, and it didn't really sway our support wherever you fell on the political spectrum. This is not a short-term issue, but in the long term, inconsistency and gaslighting undermine our critical thinking skills. It undermines our ability to evaluate new information and trust experts. And every time a political operative or spokesperson feeds us fodder over facts that, that is telling us something that negates what we've seen with our own eyes and heard with our own ears, we fill up on contradictory statements that don't hold up to our own observation skills, but we're still willing to take in that junk. And the same thing happens as if you sit down at the dinner table and night after night you're like, Doritos, yes, bring it on. This is part of a healthy dinner. After a while, when you fill up on garbage, you just start to feel weak. You can't make good, reasoned decisions anymore when all you're hearing, all you're taking in is contradictory and garbage and does not fit with your existing mental models because it turns out you're not learning and learning is how we make better decisions. 
Of course, there are also other forces at work to destabilize our trust. And we're up against all of them. There's media that works to destabilize our trust by coaching us to question facts and replace outside expertise with kind of just our own gut instincts, replace facts with what feels right. And with more access to data, people have started questioning institutions like the medical establishment. We start to question things like vaccines and global warming or climate change and other topics of, that are really topics of consensus in the scientific community. Now, this is due to the journalism of affirmation, and it offers us a very kind of comfortable echo chamber. But the downside to affirmation and media that just tells it like it is, is that our ability to evaluate observed information continues to suffer. And when we lose the ability to trust what we see firsthand, what we know to be true firsthand based on our own experiences, that's gaslighting at work. So let's take a look now at the journalism of affirmation. So this is a concept that was first developed by Bill Kovach, the former Washington bureau chief of the New York Times. He's the founder of the Committee of Concerned Journalists, and Tom Rosenstiel, who's the founder of the Project for Excellence in Journalism. And the journalism of affirmation is appealing, um, it's reassuring, and it's incredibly valuable to advertisers. It does not serve readers, it does not serve listeners, it doesn't serve people that are trying to make good choices and make more informed decisions. And they critique journalism that masquerades as being unbiased and objective, while it actually works simply to bolster the existing mindset of its audience and simultaneously insulate them from empirical fact. Another way to think of that is hearing media that's constantly telling you, you know, what you think is fine, don't take in any new information. It's journalism that attempts to separate readers from their own experiences, much like a cult. That's how cult leaders work as well. And that's dangerous. It's dangerous if you're in the business of publishing content or disseminating marketing information to help people make better choices. If you're in the business of organizing information to maybe persuade people, to educate them about services that your organization offers, or to market a product or campaign. And it's also dangerous if we're simply citizens or consumers that are trying to make more informed choices based on the media that we consume. And this kind of coaching, as I said, it encourages us to get comfortable and to get stagnant in our thoughts, rather than confidently seek out new education and test our beliefs. So we can also look to social media as part of the, the cause behind this. It used to be that we would trust outside experts, that we would trust those um, more storied arbiters of reality, maybe the trusted news anchors or editors in chief of the publications that we long look to for guidance. This has changed though, because with social media, we've started looking more to our friends or our friends or people just like us that think the way we do with their restaurant choices and their travel choices and what they value in maybe the media they consume or the news articles that they think are most important. That helps us form those filter bubbles. But as we saw in the last election cycle, our filter bubbles are getting more shaky. We're becoming more aware of the role of dark patterns, of seemingly innocuous quizzes and different photo apps that are just there to profile us, um, and the actions by foreign entities to place media that will help shift our views without actually educating us. So with all of that, as we've moved away from confidence in published information. As we moved away from the experts to then looking to people just like us, people have started to turn inward instead to say, well, let me just look to myself and what I already believe. But that's where we start to see then the effects of that poor information diet. We don't know what objective journalism looks like anymore. And yeah, this issue did start in the media, but it's everyone's problem now and the shoddy journalism and false equivalencies have undermined our very ability to analyze information. And then as our analytical skills suffer, our ability to trust external sources of expertise also suffered. And this is dire. This is something that affects our ability to proceed as a society and to make smart choices as a society. 
This is so dire, it's affecting humor too, because science used to be a common denominator of so many of our jokes, but now for some people, XKCD falls flat. And when XKCD doesn't work, we have a problem. So let's take a look beyond that, because if inconsistency, like lies, deception, deceit, if that undermines trust in both outside sources and ourselves, it's undermining our gut sense and sensibility. And when we lose self-confidence, our decision-making skills diminish. That means your users take longer to make purchases. Sales cycles are longer. They're not able to commit to a single individual or cause or maybe benefit service that is coming to them anyhow. And that's because with self-confidence and consistency or inconsistency, those things are all closely related. Because you might raise an eyebrow when you hear a politician rewrite history, or when you hear a brand pushing out this new shiny campaign that you know doesn't reflect their own harsh corporate reality. When they're telling you how great things are, all the good that they're doing, and you're saying, but I know how you treat warehouse workers, and I know how you've treated the internal culture in your company. Maybe think everything isn't quite so great. Those choices may not change how you vote or where you shop but they still affect us. They still, they still affect our different audiences that we serve. And that's because inconsistency, as it turns out, isn't some sort of external metric. It's an internal tool that we use to evaluate new information. We use it to take in new information, because remember what we were discussing earlier, that we evaluate new information not just on its own merits and not just on what we already know, but also by evaluating it against who we already are. And that's because we look for consistency with our own perceptions, as well as with how we see ourselves, because we want to feel good about our choices. We want those choices to bolster how we see ourselves, and maybe that's as being smart and savvy, or maybe as being environmentally conscious, or cultured, or self-sufficient, or worldly, or healthy. But when we evaluate choices, and we see what we want to see, we measure accuracy also against how we already think. So as we take in new information and then go through those cycles of deliberating and validating it against what we already know, we need time and space to do this. And this touches a little bit on some of what Jeffrey was just saying. And if you've heard me talk previously about <coughs> pacing in user experience or the, the merits of slow content strategy and the slower delivery of content, um, you've heard me hit on these themes. And that's where longer sentence structures or content types like comparison tools can help our users slow down, evaluate new information, and essentially mull it over and say, all right, let me revisit these choices before I commit to them. Let me check in with my gut instincts and make sure, is this still what I want? Does this still fit with what I believe and what I believe about myself? Problem is, those opportunities to, to slow down and check in with gut instincts aren't always good when we haven't been able to help our users seed their gut instincts or seed their existing mental models with valuable and valid information. Because when we're weak, we only consume information that bolsters and supports how we already think. Your audience ignores new data you push at them, no matter how beautifully it's designed, no matter how flashy or interesting it might be, if it doesn't fit with their existing mental models. And if this looks like some sort of incestuous, self-validating cycle, it is. This is the Ouroboros. This is the snake eating its own tail. And it's worse than an echo chamber. So we go through that cycle of what looks right, seems like what feels right, and that trumps what is right. And it looks an awful lot like confirmation bias. That's related, but that's not quite where we are. This is cultural predisposition. So Jamel Bowie at Slate explains cultural predisposition in that your user narrows their worldview and their ability to take in new information based on how they build their identity, based on how they see themselves. Identities shape what we believe, what we push out and what we're willing to let in. And they're an important part of how our users learn and how they shift their own thinking. So how we form our beliefs, that, that idea of cultural predisposition, that matters more than what we already believe. So if you see yourself as outdoorsy, 
as a survivalist, as a capitalist, as an entrepreneur, maybe as a concerned parent or as an urbanite or a Muslim, a Jew, a feminist, an artist or an engineer, all of those different qualifiers, all those different ideas of self-conception, um, self that mindset and identity is the, the filter through which you can take in new information. So we have to understand how our users see themselves. This is nothing new in the world of user research and how we develop personas, but it's necessary in the face of this massive trust deficit, in the face of, of cynicism in different industries. And understanding that, I think, can also give us reason to hope. And the case in point for that, I think, is actually within the anti-vaccination movement. So a recent study demonstrated that um, when people are maybe overly concerned, uh, not overly, very concerned parents, and maybe place more faith in what they know or believe about the needs of their own family members, um, and maybe are turning away from CDC vaccination schedules. It's not because they're anti-science, maybe they're just more skeptical of big pharma than of what they know to be true about their own needs. And it turns out, shocking, that no number of snarky memes on Facebook can really shift their thinking. Who knew? What does shift their thinking? What does move the needle? No pun intended. Um, on this, is instead turning to the holistic medicine practitioners they already trust and arming them with information that fits into what their patients already value. So that appeals to their idea of what it means to be a caring, concerned parent. That, that fits with what they already think about policy and vetting and safety procedures in big pharma. When we appeal to that coming from a voice that they already trust, at a level of detail that can educate them. And when we present that information with vulnerability, with empathy, rather, rather than just kind of hitting them with more hard facts, but when we couple voice and the right level of detail with that sense of vulnerability, vaccination rates start to go up. That is powerful because that's an area that many people think is pretty firmly entrenched. But we can make improvements there based on how we deliver information, who delivers it, and the tools that we give them to deliver that information. And that's because it all goes back to empowering those patients. By making them feel smart and more confident, they can make different choices. That's a powerful thing because when we can reposition experts, um, we're helping people find expertise and build expertise then within themselves. We're empowering them to make better choices. And when we meet a reluctant audience on their own terms, we can help make them champions for different ideas as well. So yes, we're in a really difficult place right now as designers. And the erosion of trust is crippling many industries, whether they're in the consumer space or government services space, um, if they're selling products or offering services or attempting to inform or persuade. But I think there's hope, and it starts with empowering our audiences. Because if people are looking inward for answers, it's our job to meet them there. So here's how. To empower our users, there are three main areas in which I think we need to focus. Let's dig into those now. So voice volume, and vulnerability. First, let's talk about voice, or that consistent, accessible, verbal and visual language that we use to, um, to engage our users, that an organization uses to express itself. When a brand changes over time, uh, maybe when it's rolling out new products or pursuing new offerings, or even changing its voice, it runs the risk of alienating longtime consumers, longtime supporters. But by using a consistent voice to express those changes um, in plain language, we can help teach people. We can help them understand what's to come, how they fit into it, how their needs will continue to be supported. And they build confidence, not just in the brand, not just in the government institution, not just in the new campaign, they build confidence also in themselves and their own knowledge of where all of this is going. 
So let's take a look at that example then with, with MailChimp. So here, email marketing company, been around for a while. When they decided a couple of years ago to roll out a new e-commerce suite of services, that turned off a lot of their, their longtime um, uh, clients, a lot of their audience. People were kind of wondering, wait, are they going to still support the legacy systems that I need and depend on? Or is e-commerce kind of their hot new thing? Or am I going to get lost in the shuffle here? So when MailChimp rolled out this new suite of products, they also launched their own e-commerce store itself. And they did that as a way to kind of talk openly about what they were doing to try out new things, um, to kind of eat the dog food themselves, and see what worked, and talk openly about what they were learning along the way. They also rolled out a blog where the store manager talked openly about what she was learning, the value that she was seeing in some of these tools. And it was open and humble and honest. And that tone of voice, that fit with what MailChimp was long known for. It was consistent with the long-term legacy voice of the brand. And that conversational tone in the plain language, in the blog, in the store, as well as then in all of the marketing copy around the new services and products themselves, that enabled their audience to understand where the brand was going and to develop a greater sense of trust in it, to understand that you know, this was still the company that, that they long knew and that they had long trusted with their other business services. For more on plain language, I also want to look at clinicaltrials.gov. So this is a website you might go to if you have a, an illness or if you want your doctor to explore a new kind of therapy, a new kind of treatment and you want to see what else is available. Now, this is kind of government adjacent, but many people came to this site thinking, it's a government site, I can trust it, anything that's there will be safe. That is not the case, though. But they still didn't want to turn people away. There's no big red flags here that are like, whoa, hold the bus on this, you're taking your life in your hands, because they want people to participate in this kind of research. But the previously, when you came to this landing page, it was much longer. It was a long wall of text. It was pretty impenetrable, and it was filled with technical language, a lot of jargon, a lot of legalese, because that's what it needed to be to protect the organization. It wasn't what it needed to be, though, to engage their audience. So they unpacked that technical language. They wanted people to participate in studies, but to still check everything with their own doctors, um, and to know that just because it's on a government site doesn't mean it can't be wrong. The big message here is to say, okay, we want you to participate, but discuss it with your healthcare provider. Now, that's an area where they also had to strike a balance. So yeah, they wanted people to embrace this idea of check in with your doctor, check in with your healthcare provider. And that's a good example of language that is accurate and precise but might be unfamiliar to some people. If you don't have a healthcare provider, but you have a doctor. But it turns out not everybody has a doctor. Sometimes people see a nurse practitioner as uh, most of their medical care, or they see a specialist. Maybe they have diabetes, so they don't bother going to a GP that often, but they always go to see their endocrinologist. This might be the kind of language that people use, and we always want to reflect the language that our audiences are already using to bring them to maybe where we need them to be. This was something that they really had to wrestle with because they wanted to be accurate and precise, but not off-putting. So they needed to strike that balance that was right for their lawyers and right for their users. So yeah, they ended up using that term, healthcare provider, because it strikes that right balance. It doesn't alienate people that maybe don't see a doctor but instead see a nurse practitioner but it reflects also the struggle within the organization to get it right, to be broad enough to welcome the greatest number of people, but still familiar enough that people could see their own language to a degree reflected in it. Let's also take a look at how that plays out now for the FBI. They had kind of a, a different problem. Um, so this is the FBI Crime Data Explorer, and when they were working to update it, the big problem that they were trying to address is that for their different audiences, which include law enforcement officers, government leaders, criminologists, students, um, 
all folks in the media that are trying to report on both jurisdictional crime and trends in crime, maybe across jurisdictions, they were coming to this site, able to see longitudinal data sifted in different ways. It was pretty user-friendly in that way. But they were getting a false sense of trust in it. Because the thing about this data is that it's optional. It's self-reported. Jurisdictions define different waves of crime in different ways. So because of that, journalists might use this for reporting only to find out that some of their numbers were not quite accurate. Maybe they were finding patterns and trends where they weren't there, but the data made it look like it was. So because this data is self-reported, it does sometimes contain gaps. It does not mean, though, it's not valid. It's still our best source of this kind of information. So what they needed to do to kind of pull people back from that edge of kind of blind faith in numbers, it's to set it in more human context, to set it in more human tone and more conversational colloquial language. So they're introducing sentences like, the CDE is an attempt to somewhat reflect that fluidity in crime. To somewhat reflect, I mean, that's not any kind of legal language. That doesn't sound overly officious. Instead, it sounds more conversational. It brings their users to a place of saying, you can trust it, but read the caveats. Know what's missing here. Maybe double check some of this before you're reporting it, kind of along big trend lines and that type of thing. The colloquial conversational language helps to really ground this data. And also then they go on to add more contextual pop-ups too, so that people still see the value, but know where there are gaps in it. And some of the publishing around it, 18F released notes talking about how they're bringing in dynamic footnotes to offer more context, to alert people when maybe they're zooming in on something and realizing that there's something missing here. The data isn't telling the full story. By taking the time to do this, they're adding in more data, oh, I'm sorry, they're adding in more detail, and they're also shifting the voice to say, all right, let's not look at this as being overly technical. These are human issues, and here's more human and humane language to dig into it as well. In this way, they're essentially art directing the data to reveal more of its context and value. So surprisingly, this, um, this kind of approach to voice, it also helps accessibility. It's helping us bring in more keywords that people scan for. Um, and also, when it's done ethically, this is also a pretty good defense against dark patterns that um, mislead people or attempt to mislead people into buying inf into information or trusting it in ways that it does not warrant. Now let's take a look at the role of volume in building trust. When I say volume, I mean the level of detail that we're offering to really tell a complete full story. One organization that is known for very complete, overly full stories is America's Test Kitchen. Is anybody here a, a fan of, of Cook's Illustrated? See, you're raising hands, and I expect to see them sort of stained with ink from like holding on to their pages and pouring over every issue. Because when they offer you content, they offer you a lot. And that's something that America's Test Kitchen is known for. So across all of their different media platforms, there's Cook's Illustrated, there's Cook's Country, there's a number of different cookbooks. They're always focusing on how do we empower home chefs to make good choices by meeting them where they are. This is not a publication, this is not a platform or a brand that is targeting just expert chefs. Instead, they're saying, okay, you're somebody that's trying to get dinner on the table tonight, or maybe you're throwing a dinner party this weekend. You wanna know how do you get it right the first time so that you're not standing there with a mess on your hands because you didn't understand how a certain chemical process or chemical reaction was supposed to work there on your stovetop. So they're speaking to novice chefs. They're also speaking to more experienced chefs with advanced techniques. If you want to dig in further, after most of their recipes, you can read about the history behind a particular technique. You can flip through later in either the cookbook or the magazine or dig deeper on their website to see different examples of it playing out. If you want to learn how to maybe like how to make beef chili and brown the beef, you can read about the history and the chemistry behind like how beef gets browned. Um, you can also read about, well, what's the right type of meat to use for this? But if you don't want to, you don't have to. 
If you want to just say, give me just the facts, I'm in a rush, maybe I'm pulling it up just on my phone or on Instagram, you can also flip through it that way, in which all of their more complex instructions are reduced to a single pithy caption right there on the image that you're flipping past. So you can find the swipeable phone version of it. And when the steps are there in the caption, you know you're still getting the full and complete story. So if you want the article relating to a particular technique, if you want that deeper read, if you want to find out about maybe ordering like Aleppo chili pepper and what's the political context surrounding it in Aleppo in Syria, you can do that. You can get the deeper read or you can get the short pithy read. It isn't so much dependent on what they're willing to put out there, but it all comes down to you, the user. And that's because the thinking in America's Test Kitchen is that they want to empower people. They're going to make sure that it really fits with the needs of their audience, wherever they are in their own level of expertise. And that's because when it comes down to it, they want to make sure that you're always successful because they know success breeds confidence. If you get it right, you're going to feel good about it, you're going to feel smarter about it and have greater confidence both in the source that you were using for that information and in yourself. And that's a pretty powerful, powerful thing. Electronics retailer Crutchfield does something very similar. So they're targeting people, not so much that are in the kitchen, but maybe home audio aficionados or people that are looking to get better sound in their car. They're offering information that is long on volume, long, long pages on their site. You can see kind of there's one long page. And what happens when people get to the bottom of that page, when they're done reading about that particular camera lens, what usually happens is they click for more. They want to get more information about it because they want to make good, informed choices. In that way, education is driving their sense of knowledge, their sense of empowerment. Empowerment is driving confidence, and confidence is driving trust. Another way to look at that is customer loyalty. People that shop from Crutchfield, when they start that shopping process with learning, with getting more information, with feeling more confident about their purchases, they may choose a different product, maybe a different camera lens or a different amplifier than they had originally planned to buy. They may decide to wait a little bit until they gain more information about it. But invariably, then they come back to make the purchase there and then buy all the other related things that they need as well because they know they can trust the information they're getting there. They also know that by getting their information from Crutchfield, they can better trust themselves. They're building that kind of gut sensibility. And this all goes back to trying to build the customer's confidence. When people feel smarter, they can make better decisions and they can push their trust out into the world more, too. So if we remember this kind of vicious cycle, where your user's already going through it, they're kind of revisiting what they're learning, saying, is this still what I want? As I'm putting this product in my shopping cart, is it still what I want to get? Do I still feel good about this? People are going to look for that information somewhere. And if you're not talking to them about home audio, who is? If you're not talking with them about how to register to vote or how to acquire government services, who is? If they're looking for that information anyhow, we should be meeting them where they are. Now that's something that gov.uk has also had to resolve. This is a case kind of on the flip side of the problems um, and the challenges and opportunities of America's Test Kitchen and, and Crutchfield. gov.uk was publishing a lot of content across nine different sites where you could visit to find out about government services. There's a lot of information there, so much so that many people in their user testing, when they were looking to see like, where people were getting information about government services, they were turning away from the government sites and instead looking to like The Guardian and other newspapers to find out information about like garbage pickup and that sort of thing. So when people are turning away from official sources for the canonical information, that's a problem, especially when those sources do have the correct versions of information. They realize not all topics need more content. Instead, sometimes we just need to say, well, what is enough content to tell a complete story and signal that it's complete so people have a sense of confidence that they got all the information they need, that they don't have to go to other places. 
Going through a very complex editorial process and rewriting content and weeding it down, over time, government um, design services, their team cut their content from 75,000 pages down to about 3,000. So how do you know when you have enough content that people don't have to just wade through multiple sites or see giant walls of text in order to be able to make good choices? How do you know when you have enough and can stop? Well, it's when our user research reveals that our audiences have enough information to feel confident and walk away. When they feel confident enough to make good choices and then move on. Now, of course, this is as much about content design and information design and content strategy as it is about more simple editorial processes. And none of this is fast. But if it's about helping people and empowering our users, not just ourselves and the brands that we represent. It doesn't need to be fast, it just needs to be right. So when we look at volume, let's look at how we're offering enough detail to convey that information is complete and to help make our users feel smart so that they can walk away with a sense that that was enough, that was comprehensive, I can make good choices in the kitchen with my next camera lens or when I'm trying to figure out how I apply for different government benefits. Finally, I want to take a look at vulnerability or that sense of how we really open up and say, your mileage may vary, but we want to make you smarter. Don't just trust what I'm saying. Don't just take it on faith, but let me share my experience with you so you can see how I got to this point as well. Um, I think we've gotten good at opening up around vulnerability. Brene Brown has kind of helped change that conversation. And maybe as individuals, we can embrace it. But the organizations that we represent don't always get it. They're not always on the same page. And I think that's with good reason. In many organizations, the idea of sharing more openly, admitting to mistakes, admitting to our own learning processes, that's a scary thing. Things have changed a lot, though, over the past few decades. In the 80s, remember when the ad campaigns were kind of big and shiny and things just went out only when they were perfectly polished and finished? It was kind of like everybody wore shoulder pads to be bigger than they were and even our brands kind of wore visual shoulder pads too. Everything, every organization tried to seem more polished and finished and bigger than it was. Now there's really an opportunity to make things more human scale. To say, hey, just like a little scrappy startup, we're learning and figuring it out as well. And that's why organizations that launch on Kickstarter, why so many of them remain on Kickstarter for subsequent product launches. Is they realize the value in reaching out directly to their audiences and sharing information, getting input. That's why opportunities to user test, bring people into the co-design process, help our organizations and help our brands because it reveals our humanity and fallibility and our ability to really open up and learn as companies and organizations ourselves. BuzzFeed has tried an interesting approach to this. So sometimes vulnerability means prototyping in public. And especially it's good if it's an opportunity to show your audience how you're changing, what you're learning, so that they can be a part of, a part of that learning process too. I don't like to look at, at, BuzzFeed, uh, at BuzzFeed to reference for, for most examples. Um, we know them, of course, for top 10 lists and all, uh, which are probably more the province of Letterman and God, and BuzzFeed is neither of those things. But I think they can teach us something really valuable here. So when they were launching, they said, let's find a new way to visualize our data, when they were launching a new way to share their data. So they were trying out different ways of depicting things, different approaches to visual design and information design and frequently sharing it with their audience to say, this is a new way we're looking at visualizing this information. What do you think? And the comments were open for anyone to see. That can be a dangerous prospect. But for them, it was a nice way to, to bring their audience into that design process. Same thing there on the right for, for MailChimp. When they launched that e-commerce store, Freddie and company, and they shared their new e-commerce tools and said, we're using them too. Here are the problems we're having with them. Here are the issues that we see with running an e-commerce business today and dealing with all the forms and whatnot. It was an opportunity for their customers to see that they were learning too and engage in that learning process with them, to engage in all those shared trials and tribulations. It was a way for them to bring their sense of empathy that 
they were really good at talking about, it was a way for them to bring it out and operationalize it. And things like vulnerability and empathy, those are buzzwords that we toss around in marketing conversations, but this is about how we actually operationalize it and bring it to the forefront of our businesses. And sometimes that kind of emotional upheaval or emotional labor can look like revisiting your past claims, revisiting things that you believed, where you want to demonstrate your evolution. So again, Cook's Illustrated, America's Test Kitchen, across all their different platforms. Another thing they're known for is revisiting their past claims, revisiting their past product recommendations. In this case, um, they've got an update on knife sharpeners. So in an earlier issue, they evaluated 20 different knife sharpeners only to say, this is the best one, this is what we recommend, but now they've got new information. They're able to say there are new products on the market. Who knew that the world of knife sharpeners could change so rapidly and be so cutting edge? But they did, and they said, oh, uh, that's a good one, right? I like that one. Uh, they said, yeah, let's revisit this. Let's revisit our previous claims and see, do we still stand behind these ideas, or are we taking in a new information and wrangling with it in a responsible way? and saying, here's what we believe now. Their audience trusts them for that kind of, really, vulnerability, for being willing to say, we were wrong. Here's what we recommend now. And comparison tools help us do that as well. So Volkswagen, on their site, if you visit it and you say, all right, this is the kind of vehicle I'm looking for. Maybe I want um, a wagon that is a stick shift and a diesel. Turns out, in the US, there's like maybe two vehicles that will give you that. Maybe it's Volkswagen and Subaru and maybe BMW. You don't have a lot of options, but if you take away some of those variables, maybe you don't need the diesel, you don't need the, the dirty Volkswagen diesel. Maybe if you still say, though, I want a stick shift and I want a wagon, you can use their comparison tools to find out what will be right for you, and sometimes they're taking their customers and saying, Go, go find that one that, that you looked at that is more right for you that's on Subaru's website. Find what's right for you. It's fine that you came here just for the information. They're building an audience in that way of people that can trust their more unbiased content, or at least content that has the, the varnish of being unbiased. By suggesting competitors you might want to consider, they're educating their audience and empowering them because it's the user that's most important in the car buying process, or really in any of the processes that we design for. So they're telling people, do your own research, see for yourself. We can tell you what we'd recommend, but you know your needs best. Going back to BuzzFeed, they do something else like that. So they curate at the end of many of their articles now something called Outside Your Bubble. And it's basically saying, we want to help break down those filter bubbles, and we will be the voice of saying, let's see what other people are saying. So at the end of an article, you might see a feature like this that brings in what other people are saying on Reddit, popular tweets on, on Twitter and all, what else is going on around this particular topic on Facebook. They're saying, we will tell you what else is out there. Now go, look at it. Not because we should be your one source of all information, but because we want to empower you to be smarter about the information that you read. That's a real position of vulnerability. It's a real position of leadership. And for people that do get their news here, they know that they can trust that they'll be able to get more than just what they see on that particular page. So when we look at vulnerability, that's where we, really where we can start to favor comparison over exclusion and open processes to work with our users, not just for them, but to help them be smarter as well. So remember, we do like evolution. We do like when we can see how brands change, and we especially like when we're smart about that process. And for our users, when we can empower them and build their confidence, it reflects back on the organizations that we all represent. So to look at this all together now, this is what I want to leave you with. When we can focus on voice and volume and vulnerability, not only does it make for a better user experience, it makes for smarter users as well. We can regain their trust when we empower them. And that's what our brands need, that's what our organizations need, that's what our society needs. But what if 
all this is still hopeless, not to end on a downer or anything like that, what if this is all hopeless? What if where we are now is as good as it's ever going to get? Because a lot of people do say right now we live in this post-fact era. But I always wonder if this is a post-fact era, when was the fact era? Because that's, that's a question, but it's not a fruitful discussion. Because that way is cynicism, and cynicism is intellectual cowardice. I truly believe that. I wish I said it, but it was Henry Rollins. And just because we're swimming in skepticism and cynicism, though, it does not mean that we have to be cynics. It does not mean that we have to support our users' cynicism. Because cynics look at the world as it is and say it's worse. Designers look at the world as it is and say, it can be better, and I'm going to lead that process. Because the thing is, hearing politicians lie and dissemble, or hearing brands lie and dissemble to us, that's nothing new. And our heroes in the media could always take them down, but maybe as designers, that's more of our job now. Maybe as people that, that forge a better human experience, that forge better user experiences, that's part of our job now. Because we here in this room, we help people engage with the world and also feel more confident about their role in it. So if we can help the people trust the systems that they need and the forms and services that are designed for them, we can help them be better citizens and better consumers of that information. We can help them build a greater sense of trust. And trust is the slayer of cynicism. And again, I truly believe that. And that I did say, maybe because I've been watching too much Game of Thrones and, and Stranger Things. But trust is the slayer of cynicism. And we can arm our users. We can empower them to embrace trust. Now, are we uniquely positioned to fix this problem? Of course not. But just because we're not, it doesn't free us from doing our part. And will our work rid every sector of the problems of cynicism? No. But just because this problem is bigger than the websites in our charge and the user experiences that we enable and the organizations they work for, again, it does not mean that we cannot do our part. Because we can design our way out of cynicism. We can design for trust. And we need to for ourselves, for our teams, for our organizations, and for broader society. So let's get started. Thank you.